Right. So today we want to continue our lesson on group account and consolidation. In this lesson, we basically want to look at IFRS 3. IFRS 3 is also one of the um, accounting standard that governs the preparation and presentation of consolidated financial statements. So in today's lesson, we want to look at all that goes into what IFRS 3 and IFRS 3 is basically IFR3 is basically business combination business combination business combination and here yeah, the objective of IFRS3 the objective of IFRS3 is to improve the relevance the reliability the comparability information presented in the financial statement about what about business combination and its effect so basically to improve upon the information presented in the financial statement about what about business combination and, it, and its effects so basically the principle here is just three things is to the specific principle here is to um how to measure or how to recognize and measure the assets acquired the liability assumes and then the non-controlling interest so that is one so we are looking at asset liability and then non-controlling interest and then we are looking at recognition and measurement of goodwill and then the last one is what disclosure so disclosure so basically these are the specific principle the specific objective of ifrs3 business combination all right so before we go deeper into it what is business combination so definition of business combination when we talk about business combination we are looking at a transaction or an event that gives rise to an acquirer obtaining control over one or more businesses so anytime remember what is an acquirer if you don't know what is an acquirer go to our introduction video on the um, consolidated financial statement and you know what is an acquirer basically the entity acquiring another entity or obtaining control of another entity is what we refer to as the acquirer or an investor so here we say that anytime the acquirer obtained control over one or more businesses then we say it is what a business combination now how do we identify that an acquisition warrants a business combination sometimes it is very clear if the entity is acquiring another entity then it is what it's a business combination but in a case where the entity is acquiring some assets of the another entity, then it is required that you identify whether the acquisition is a business combination or not. Because if it's a business combination, then you have to apply the relevant standard in accounting for what's consolidated financial statement. And if it is not, then you have to apply the other relevant financial you know, reporting standards in accounting for the interest in the entity. So in this case, the standard have prescribed some element that will help us to identify whether the acquisition is a business combination or not. Remember that in this case, it's only when the entity is acquiring an asset in another entity. But in most instances, if the entity is acquiring the another company, like there's a measure, then we say that it's what is a business combination. So there are three elements prescribed by the standard that if the entity is acquiring another asset in another entity then we cannot readily see or we cannot obviously see that it's a business combination then we have to use those elements to check if it is a business combination or not and the first element has to do with input input and basically input here they are looking at the materials that are used in the production process so here we are looking at pp we are looking at inventories and inventories uh, and the rest and then two the second element we are looking at processes processes we are looking at the workforce the production process the production plan everything that will help to convert this input into another output we are looking at the processes and then the third one has to do with what the output <clears throat> the end result of the input and process is the output. So here we are basically looking at returns, returns in the form of dividends or interest. So 
for us to say that an acquisition of an asset and another entity is a business combination, there are three elements that must be, what, must be present. Input, process, and output. But there are sometimes still, it is a difficult thing to determine whether what an acquisition of an, another, another entity is a business combination or not. And the standard prescribed that we use a test, what we call a concentration test. Concentration test. And remember, this concentration test is optional. And remember that we only go through all these three elements if we cannot, from the beginning of the acquisition, determine that the entity acquiring another entity is a business combination or not. But if we can readily determine that, then we don't need to even go through all these elements before we even use the concentration test. How then do we account for business combination? Remember that the business combination does not prescribe the guidance or does not give the procedures in preparing or presentation of financial statement but it warrants or what it does is that it complements IFRS 10 that is a consolidated financial statement in the preparation of financial statement but this particular standard has not prescribed the specific procedures in the consolidation procedure or processes now how do we account for business combination the standard prescribed that business combination should be accounted for using the acquisition method the acquisition method so we account for business combination using the acquisition method now before you can use the acquisition method is basically uh, you know given in four steps accounting for business combination business combination using acquisition method comes with just four steps so basically that is what we are going to look at over here so step one step one has to do with identify the acquirer you identify the acquirer identify the, the acquirer here basically we want to look at at the date that you are the transaction is taking place you want to know who is the parent and basically the parent is the one always you know obtaining control over another entity or obtaining significant influence over another entity here mostly it's it's readily known that this is the parent because anytime i'm acquiring a parent is acquiring another entity then it is known but in the case of a measure in the case of a measure we can also say that the larger entity is the one that is obtaining control over the what smaller entity but don't forget there can also be a reverse you know measure reverse measure is when the smaller entity is taking over a larger entity so mostly we have to identify what the acquirer then step two is you determine the acquisition date so we determine the acquisition date so determining the acquisition date that is step two now determining the acquisition date is actually the date that the acquirer has obtained control over the another entity that particular date is the acquisition date mostly the reporting date but sometimes it may differ depending on what or when the acquirer is obtaining control over the other entity but mostly it is at the reporting date then step this is step two so in the step three of the business combination or accounting for business combination using the acquisition method is that you um, recognize and measure your assets acquired so we are looking at asset acquired here i'm using initials liability assumed and then non-controlling interest you will look at what is non-controlling interest soon so that is a step three so and step four have to do with a recognition and measurement of goodwill of goodwill recognition and measurement of goodwill so we are going to go extensively into this last um, two steps step three and then step uh, four all right so step three basically talks about we should recognize and measure our what the asset acquired the liability assumed and the non control interest now in the process of measuring your assets and liability we have to determine the fair value of those assets and liability on the date of or at the date of what acquisition so you have to determine the fair values of them that is basically about recognizing the assets and liabilities now recognition of assets sometimes the acquiree or the investee may not recognize an asset like an intangible asset but the acquirer may probably what 
see those items as an asset. So therefore, we account for them or we recognize them at the date of acquisition as what as an asset. That is the recognition of asset liability and the measurement of what asset liability using the fair value or the market value on the date of what acquisition. Now, the second recognition and uh, acquisition is non-controlling interest. Non-controlling interest. What is not controlling interest? Not controlling interest is the equity uh, is the equity that does not um, belong to or does not belong either directly or indirectly to the um, parent. So equity, uh, you know, interest in a subsidiary we call non-controlling interest is basically the equity interest in a subsidiary that does not directly or indirectly belongs to what to the parent. Here we are saying that, assuming that a parent A PLC PLC is acquiring eighty percent of B PLC of B PLC, so it is the A who is acquiring B is the parent over here. The twenty percent that is left is what we call non-controlling interest. Sometimes um. Previously, the, it was referred to as minority interest, so we can also look at it as minority interest. But in a case where the entity acquires 100%, remember that a non-controlling interest, there's not like a non-controlling interest in that particular subsidiary. We will probably look at this extensively later on when we are dealing with the IFRS 10 consolidated financial statement. Now, remember that. It's an equity instrument in the what in the subsidiary that does not belong directly or indirectly to the what to the parent. So that one belongs to another holders of what another people investing in that particular subsidiary. Now, how do we account for this? How do we measure this? So we measure the non-controlling interest using two methods. So we have the net method one, we measure it at the proportionate share of the fair values of the subsidiary's net assets. So we use two methods in measuring our non-controlling interest. Non-controlling interest. This one is the proportionate share of the um, fair value of the non-controlling interest in the net, uh, sorry, of the um, subsidiary's net asset. Here, anytime the NCI is valued or is measured at proportionate share, then they don't partake or they are not affected by goodwill. They don't partake in goodwill. Anything about goodwill does not affect them. So remember, and mostly all the questions will tell you how NCI is valued, either at the proportionate share or the second one is that either at the full um, fair value, full fair value, full fair value. And this is based on the market um, value of the shares in the NCI, in this NCI. So, so based on the fair value of what the shares of the NCI. So here, you see that we use the proportionate share or we use the full fair value. Here, anytime the NCI is valued at full fair value or full fair value, then they affect what we call goodwill. So impairment of goodwill, it will affect them. Uh, anything about goodwill, also partake in goodwill. So remember that. But in case they are measured at proportionate share, then they are not affected by goodwill. Nothing affects them. They don't partake in goodwill. If there is a good uh, impairment of goodwill, it doesn't go to them. So depending on how an NCI is measured and depending on how they are affected with goodwill, remember they are measured at either proportionate share or full fair value. All right. So the step four, step four is about the recognition. And measurement of goodwill, of goodwill. Sometimes you may also call it gain on bargain purchase, depending on what is happening after the acquisition. Now, what is goodwill? Goodwill is actually um, assets representing future economic benefits arising from the acquisition of other assets or arising from other assets acquired. In a business combination that cannot be individually what identified or separately recognized. So anytime we talk about goodwill, we are saying that it's an asset that represents future economic benefits arising from other assets acquired. 
that this must be in a business what combination if they cannot be individually identified neither can it be what separately recognized this should say that we have internally generated goodwill here we are looking at acquired goodwill not internally generated goodwill purchased goodwill because it is happening as a result of business combination what does this mean assuming that a acquires b by paying uh, hundred thousand dollars but the net asset of b the net asset of b is just eighty thousand you know dollars if this is the case then the good rule here is going to be the twenty thousand that is the difference between the consideration paid and the net asset of the asset that is being acquired gives us what we call goodwill but extensively when we want to look at goodwill goodwill is actually an aggregate of three items less by the net asset an aggregate of three items here we are looking at the consideration transferred the consideration transfer the fair value of nci nci and then if the acquisition is done in stages they want to look at the fair value of previously held interest so the fair value of previously um, held interest you add these three you add these three over here and then we less the next the next asset of the entity we are acquiring and this gives us goodwill this should give us goodwill over here all right mostly the goodwill here should be um, a positive figure okay so this figure should always be bigger than this figure this figure should always be bigger than this figure but in a situation where the net asset is bigger than the other asset then we call it gain on by gain purchase and there is a way to account for it remember this one is supposed to be healed and amortized or um, healed for impairment review at the end of every period so remember that it is the fair value of the consideration transfer the amount you paid the fair value of the nci holdings and then the fair value of previously held interest if the acquisition is done in stages here we here if we said acquisition is done in stages it simply means that there are sometimes an entity may be having 30 percent already you know in an entity and may further go ahead and acquire 35 percent and this is given the two of them combined is given what control so this we call it what acquisition done in stages this one was purchased first before this one so here we will look at what fair value of the what the previously held interest at the acquisition date we have to add this three and get this value and then we take our net asset of the entity acquired from it to get our goodwill but if this place ends up to be a negative then we call it gain on bargain purchase now how do we treat that gain on bargain purchase you have to go back and do the recalculation so maybe you assume that there may be an error in your calculation so you go back and do the recalculations but if everything you know uh, end up to be correct then you immediately account for that gain on bargain purchase in your profit or loss account as what well as an income to the parent or to the acquired entity uh, the acquirer the investor of the parent entity as well as profit so remember that is how to deal with what gain on by gain purchase so here if there is a good rule then you have to probably hold it for employment review at the end of accounting period now the last thing under business combination is disclosure so disclosure of important items how the entity was acquired the percentage obtained the element that around that it is a business combination and any other important you know th uh, thing to be done how you even probably measure your assets and your abilities you know assume the asset acquired the ability assumes how you are going to measure your non-controlled interest either that proportionate share or at the fair value all those information must be disclosed to the note you know to the financial statement remember the objective of business combination is to improve from the what the relevance the reliability the comparability information um, of a financial statement about what about a business combination and what and its effects and therefore there is much emphasis on what on 
the disclosure requirement. So basically, that is business combination or IFR3. Remember, it does not prescribe the procedures to what to consolidate, but it gives guidance. You will not when we go further, we will probably make use of how MCI is valued and probably when there's a good rule, how do we account for them? And is this business what um combination IFR3 that gives us that's what that um, guidance but it doesn't give us the procedures to what to consolidate but it's also complement IFRS 10 in the consolidation what procedure. Thank you and follow the consolidation procedure whilst we um, you know we guide you on how to consolidate easily. Thank you.